we'll stand.
also welcome you in our hearts tonight. And uh, Lord, may uh, you, Lord, be on the throne of our hearts. Lord, we know that uh, worship is, is not only lifting our voices and in, in, in giving you glory and ascribing worth to you, but Lord, it's also, Lord, yielding to you, surrendering to you. We're giving our hearts over to you. So, Lord, be welcome in this place as you're welcome in our hearts. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. See, with open hearts. With open hearts and lifted hands. Jesus be enthroned, 
Sit in ruins deep. Your grace is born. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me.
So teach my song to rise to you. Stand or fall on you. Oh Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand or fall. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every day I need you. Upon the cross he took my sin by his blood he set me free I desire Jesus all oh, his name my soul esteem.
Let's all stand. No. 
Thank you for meeting us here. Lord, we have all tasted and have seen that the Lord is good. Lord, that's why we're here, Lord. Nothing else will do. And that's why we lean in to you and run to you and uh, yield to you, surrender to you, worship you. And that's why we're here. Lord, here, here to hear from you. And so, Lord, continue to be ministered to by the just the attitude of our heart. We want to receive all that you would have for us tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to turn and greet someone around you and have a seat. Light in the darkness, a city on a hill. Jesus entrusted the church to continue his teaching, to equip his people to be disciples, and to make disciples. There's no greater mission. We love the church, and that's why we've created Right Now Media. In this busy, mobile, noisy world, Right Now Media is a resource to help cut through the distractions that hinder consistent growth and discipleship. When your church subscribes to Right Now Media, every member gets free access to a huge library of video Bible studies, over 10,000 streaming video sessions from more than 150 Christian publishers and ministries, available anytime, anywhere. We've got stuff for small groups, youth groups, personal devotion, Bible studies on marriage, parenting, finance, and leadership, and a ton of high-quality, safe, biblical kids material. We want to help you equip and unleash everyone in your church for the glory of God, to be a light in the darkness, a city on a hill, because we love the church and the mission of the church matters. Hello moms, it's that time of year again where we gather to encourage one another at our Mentoring Mom sessions. We meet at 9.30 in the morning on the last Friday of every month through May. Childcare will be provided and you can sign up online or at the Resource Center. We'll see you there. We want to encourage those serving in any of our Sunday ministries to park on our offsite parking lot. This helps us free up parking spaces for visitors and those just staying for one service. The offsite parking lot is located north of Imperial Highway at the Los Lomas Elementary School. We provide free shuttle service and friendly shuttle drivers will be happy to get you where you need to go. And this service is not for servants only but is also available to anyone who would like to avoid the parking rush. Thank you, and we'll see you in service. All right. How many of you guys go to first service here? Raise your hand. Uh, that's like half. So I don't need to ask that question again for the second, do I? All right. Um, Sometimes we, we, uh, we aren't able to really get our minds around how God is working completely in the church because we're seeing just maybe segments of it. Um, I know that Lori keeps me updated on what's going on with the women's ministry, but um, the times I, I walk in there and I see all you guys meet, I'm like, whoa, this thing's really, uh, it's not as happening as the men's ministry, but it's really, you know, happening. And, um, you, right guys, amen, if you were here last night, you're like, right, <laughs> um, little competition thing, that's it, it's okay. But, uh, and, and I know that you gals, maybe, you know, we come home and we try and tell you, we don't use many words, but we try and come home and tell you, like, what's going on with the men, and, uh, 
and God is, is saving people, and God is, you know, connecting people, and God's adding to the church, and with that comes um, great challenges. I know for me, um, I, 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 I kind of look back on the season, and the last 10 years went by so fast, and um, had no idea what God would be doing, the new people that he'd be bringing around, even last night, just inundated, um, serving guys at the meal, and inundated with new guys, sharing their names, how long they've been coming, and, and just an, an overload of new people. And um, so you probably see what you see on a first service or a second service, but these services are, are very full. And uh, when we run an announcement like that, we're, 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 we're thinking through the new people. We're thinking through, um, you know, like just that first time they're here, if they got to you know, come onto the property and they, they're directed off because there's no parking spots, like how how that might play out in their, their, you know, experience here. So we're appealing to people that are involved here, and there's well over 300 servants here at the church. And so if we can just be, like, thinking as a servant, giving preference to the newer people, and um, obviously if you've got family, you got kids and all that, you know, the parking, that's what we want first and foremost. But um, many of you do park off-site and, and around, and we thank you for that. But as we're seeing further growth, um, we just want to encourage you guys, especially, of course, on Sundays, um, this is the challenge. Uh, if you could use the shuttle and all that, that would be just great. But um, let's turn our Bibles over to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 at this time. Um, almost done with this book. A couple more chapters after this. Hopefully you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed studying it. I've really uh, gleaned so much out of Ecclesiastes. It's a go-to. I, I refer to it a lot as I'm talking uh, with people, but again, uh, Solomon, um, just looking at life, looking at the world, life under the sun, as he calls it, and uh, looking for for true meaning, looking for you know what we would want to value in life under the sun, and uh, basically he 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 contemplates all of this. Uh, from a very interesting perspective. He's the guy that you might say really does know it all because he's the wisest guy, and he really does have it all because he's the wealthiest guy, which affords him uh, the ability to, to build uh, massive buildings and cities, uh, to be around the, the brightest of engineers and architects and baffle them with his ideas and with his insights, to have servants upon servants and, and, and just this governance over uh, a massive amount of people when, when, when times were well. And, and looking at all of that, the, the average person would say, I wish I had all of that. I would find meaning in that. I would be fulfilled in that. But Solomon, this man of wisdom, he contemplates all of that. Life as it's the best that life can throw at you. And then he, he, he concludes over and over in this book, it's vanity. It's just vanity. It's just emptiness. Until he brings God into the equation and those very things that he's observing that had no meaning, that had no fulfillment, all of a sudden have meaning and have fulfillment. So that's the, that's the book of Ecclesiastes. And, you know, really when you, when you look at life without God, you're looking at life without his plan. And when you look at life without God's plan, oh, there's got to be a plan. Whose plan is it? It's going to be your plan. And, you know, when you, when, you, when, you, when you come to your own ideas and your own, your own plan, Solomon c- concludes that it's just inferior and it's absolutely futile. And so... Uh, Blasting through this book, we've looked at him walking into the courtroom and finding this out, into the marketplace, into the highways, into the palace, into the temple. He, he, in chapter 6, he talked about specifically gaining wealth and honor, and without God, the equation, vanity. In, in, in that whole chapter 6 and 7, he talked about longevity of life. Some people, if I just live, you know, like a whole lot of years, then that's meaningful, and that's, you know, no, he's like, that's, that's not the case. He's like, you know, no matter how much you possess, if you don't possess the ability to enjoy it, it's just meaningless. And, and bringing God into the equation is, 
when we begin to enjoy what he has created and what he has allotted to us. And if it was a number of years, um, he's like, if, if you just looked at those years and thought I would be you know, fulfilled with longevity, he's like, that's not the case. The only time you're going to be fulfilled with life, the, the term that, that you live, is if you see it as a gift from God. Amen? I mean, that's, that's clear. Then in, in chapter 7 and 8, he came to the topic of wisdom again, and he began to discuss the importance of, of wisdom and consider whether or not um, wisdom can make life better. And he concluded, he concluded wisdom can make our lives you know, better, clearer, stronger, but only if it's the wisdom we gain from bringing God into the equation of our life. Um, in chapter 8, he was considering wisdom in light of, of evil, living in an evil world. And he concluded that wisdom can't explain every mystery. Wisdom can't solve every problem, but it will help us navigate through a world that is full of evil. But that wisdom, again, that he's talking about there would be that of bringing God into the equation. And even in an evil world, you can find meaning and fulfillment by bringing God into the equation because he's going to help you navigate through that world. Chapter 9, we were here last time, we talked about, uh, he talked about death. And, and he says, the wise man realizes that death is a part of everybody's life. Verses 1 through 10, it's unavoidable. The wise person will consider death because death is, it's going to come their way. In, in light of this, in chapter Nine, he was like, man, we need to live life to its fullest. Don't sit around and brood. Go, we said. Get up and live. Make the most out of what he talked about was the, the common experiences in life. The home life, the, the family life, friendship. Enjoy your wife. Even enjoy your work. Make every occasion special. Make it a special occasion, even if it's ordinary and routine, because Life is unpredictable. You just don't know how much more of it you have to live down here. Now, chapter 10. Dead flies putrefy the, perf the, the perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. Now, here Solomon starts off chapter 10, and he begins to look at the importance of wisdom, and he kind of contrasts that to the danger of folly. In chapter 2, Solomon said that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. In chapter 7, Solomon said that, well, he talked about the wickedness of folly. And each time he brings up the word folly in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, he's talking about Madness. He's talking about recklessness. He's talking about stupidity. He's talking about craziness. Now he's laying down a basic principle. And the basic principle is that folly creates serious problems for those who commit it. Dead flies putrefy the per perfumer's ointment and cause it to give off a foul odor. Now in chapter 7, Solomon used the same um, example of, of a perfume, and he, and he compared a good name to a fragrant perfume. Now he says that, that dead flies are to perfume what folly is to the reputation of a wise person. The conclusion is this. It's logical. Wise people will stay away from folly. Now, why is one person foolish? And why is another person wise? Well, in verse 2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. So why is one person wise? Why is one person a fool? Well, it all depends upon the inclination of their heart. In the ancient world, the right hand was the place of power, the, the place of honor, while the left hand represented weakness and even rejection. Many people considered the left hand in that culture to be unlucky. 
the, the English word that we use, sinister, it, it comes from a Latin word that means on the left hand. Now, this is all just kind of ancient, ancient convictions. Now, Solomon's saying, listen, since the fool doesn't have wisdom in his heart, he gravitates towards that which is wrong, that which is on the left, and he gets into trouble. Speaking of the right hand, Solomon is talking about something that is superior. That's the reference there. The idea is that the, the man of wisdom is guided by superior things. Also in the ancient world, the, the right hand was seen as the place of protection. Solomon is, is also showing the value of wisdom by stating that a wise person has the quality of heart and mind that is going to protect them from danger. Conversely, a fool, he, a fool lacks such sense. Thus, he's guided by inferior things, reckless things, crazy things, stupid things. And this is all evidenced by his foolish behavior. As he says in verse 3, even when a fool walks along the way, now, that phrase in the Hebrew is a common phrase that, that actually speaks of, it's like a figure of moral behavior. So even when a fool walks along the way, a reference to moral is moral behavior, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool. Simply said, a fool shows everyone that he is foolish by the way he lives his life. You don't have to guess who is a fool. A, a fool could never keep the fact that he is a fool from anybody. The moment that a fool steps out of, out of their house, foolishness is on display. Now, we, we know that what we are on the inside comes out. It, it displays on the outside. Even with our speech, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the the heart, the mouth, speaks. Our, our mouth, in, in, a, in a very interesting way, it's, it's a great way to take the, the moral temperature of a person's life. Our mouth. What comes out of our mouth is a, a great way to take the spiritual temperature of a person's life. Our mouth, it's a great way to, to look at a person and and deduce, are they mature, are they immature? Are they wise, or are they fools? By our mouth. And what, what could be said of our mouth can also be said of our life, how we live out our life. So having laid down this principle, Solomon is going to apply this principle to, to four different kinds of fools. In, in verses 4 through 7, Solomon talks about foolish leaders. How a wise person will conduct himself before foolish leaders is the idea. So verse 4. In the spirit of the ruler rises, if, excuse me, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. For conciliation pacifies great offenses. And so he's talking about a, a leader, maybe of a nation, maybe of a city, maybe of a company, whatever it might be, but someone has a lot of authority. If, if this leader, this leader is proud, they might, they might say very foolish things, and, and it might cause that leader to lose all kinds of respect in the eyes of the people that they lead. So let's first address the leader, because I think it's worthy of addressing. A proud leader. If a man has no control over himself, how is he going to have any competent control, any effective control over those that he leads? Just think through that logically. Proverbs 16.32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Solomon said it a different way, Proverbs 25, 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit 
is like a city broken down without walls. Now, a city without walls is vulnerable. It, it's vulnerable to the attacks of, of the enemy. And an undisciplined, undisciplined excuse me, person who lacks self-control is also vulnerable to trouble. They're showing that they that they are, are that, that someone has penetrated them or someone is able to penetrate them. Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding. But he who is impulsive exalts folly. And then earlier in Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 9, Solomon again says, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. And in the New Testament equivalent of all of that is where James clearly tells us in James chapter 1, 19 and 20, that we are to be quick to hear and slow to speak and, and slow to anger because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In their life or in the lives of the people that they are impacting. Now, let's, impress, let's, let's address secondly the people under the leader. Just because a, a leader acts like a fool... That does not mean that it is necessary for those under him to follow him and act like a fool. To act foolishly is the idea. Solomon says it's far better that they control themselves, that they, that they stay right where they are and they seek to bring peace. Do not leave your post. Don't leave your post. For conciliation pacifies Great offenses. He's speaking to the wise man, and he's like, do not leave your post. God might have you there for the purpose of pacifying someone. Don't miss that. This is, this is very, very important. Proverbs 25, 15 says, Through patience a ruler can be persuaded, and a gentle tongue can break a bone. What does that mean? That's a very difficult phrase there. It's an unusual figure of speech. But the idea is that the, the, the response, the softly spoken words can accomplish difficult things, the, the broken bones. Also, persuading a ruler to follow some difficult course of action, it, it's, it takes patience. It's not easy. Again, Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Our flesh's first reaction to someone's meanness is to be mean right back to them. But that's only going to add fuel to the fire, and it's unwise. Proverbs 16, 14. A king's wrath is a messenger of death, but a wise man will appease it. You can take this into the workplace. You can take that into this place. You can take that into your home. You can take that into the city you live in, in the nation that we live in. Now, some people, they won't like to take this counsel. They claim the high ground of morality. They focus on the fact that, well, listen, I don't act that way. I'm not an angry person. I'm not a proud person. I don't belittle people. I don't yell at people. So I don't deserve to be treated that way. I deserve, they take that high moral ground, to be treated just like the great, amazing way that I treat everybody else. And Solomon says, that's not reality. It's just not reality. God hasn't called you to put that expectation on them. God has called you to embrace his expectation for you. And his expectation for you is to hold the ground, to stay the course. Do not leave the post. Now, if we had by a show of hands how many of us in our, our workplace have some people with authority that from time to time are offensive with that authority, I'm sure all of us would raise our hands in this room. And so the question would be, okay, you're going to leave your post. Listen, a post that, if you've prayed for that job, and you're a Christian, you should believe that God gave you that job. 
And if God gave you that job, he might have given you that job for that one really difficult boss that needs to be appeased. That one person that just can't handle authority, that abuses the authority, they're proud, they're obnoxious, they get angry all the time. But maybe God gave you that job to just live out all of these Proverbs. To show them what it's like to not live in the flesh. To show them what it's like to be under the hand and, and, and under the, the, the affluence of something greater than their flesh. Anybody can get emotional. Anybody can react in the emotion. Anybody can react in the flesh and justify it by comparing themselves to that action. But Solomon's saying the wise man sees opportunity here. The wise man will not leave his post. The wise man will look at the situation, size up the situation, and go, okay, God, how are you going to use me in this situation? And you're not going to react. A soft answer. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. A wise man will appease that. So, the other thing to consider is, you leave the post because there's some people that are just being abusive with their authority, but you're just going to go to another place where chances are you're going to find some people that aren't real good with authority. Solomon says, don't be driven by the emotion of the moment, especially when your pride is hurt. Verse 5. There is an evil I have seen under the sun. As an error proceeding from the ruler, folly is set in great dignity while the rich sit in a lowly place. Now, Solomon's like looking at the world under the sun. When he uses that phrase, like bring God out of the equation. <laughs> and he's seeing some things that aren't fair. He's seeing some injustices. And, and here he's looking at, at, at rulers, certain rulers, certain, certain leaders. And they, they promote people to positions and places of authority that have no business in that position or in that place of authority. People look at that promotion of that particular person that shouldn't ever be given that particular position because they haven't earned it. There's no merit to it. There's no ability that would support it. And they look at that, and it's a poor reflection on the ruler that, that used no discernment or poor judgment and put that person who should have never been in that position in that position. In verse 6, folly is set in great dignity while the, while the rich. Now, when he uses the word rich here in this term, it's not like we are seeing the, the stigma placed on rich people in our culture. In this culture, the, the, the rich person pictured the competent, accomplished, qualified person. And so he's like, folly is set in great dignity. While the, the competent, qualified person is basically sat in a lowly place. Because I'm looking around at life under the sun, life without God in the equation, and I see some of these rulers and the people who should not be promoted and given positions of authority are actually promoted and given positions of authority. While the competent, accomplished people who should be given positions and promotions are, are kind of set back. The servants are riding the horses. And the nobles are, are, are holding the reins and pulling them through town. That's the picture. Proverbs 19.10 says, Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. And there's, there's all kinds of reasons that this can happen in culture, our society today. Nepotism is one. There could be just... The bloodline, you know, the, whether it's in a, a political position or whether it's in the business or even in, 
in the church. You know, there's, there's just by virtue of that's my family. I, I, I don't care if they're, they're capable. I don't care if they have the ability or not. I don't, I don't, I don't care if there's the, the, the merit, they've earned it or not. I just, it's nepotism. I'm going to promote, I'm going to give the position because of the bloodline. And we see that all around the world in different parts of the world. We've seen the same thing with the attempted advancement of Marxism, communism. Even as, as Hitler tried to promote his you know, takeover of the world, the, the, the one thing that all of those evil men and their evil ways had in common is that they, they tried to remove and, and slaughter the, the professionals and the, the ones that were accomplished. When you think about this, if you or I tomorrow had to go to, you know, I had someone call me today and they're like, hey, pray for me, I got eye surgery tomorrow. And I'm sure before this individual chose an eye surgeon, they did a little bit of background. You know, what if, what if you, you went to your dentist tomorrow, let's say, and you had to get, I don't know, some surgery on your mouth or an eye surgeon tomorrow, or you, God forbid you, were, you found yourself in front of a heart doctor tomorrow. And you walked in and all of a sudden they're like, you know, hey, I, I got a nephew. He's just, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of, he really never went through med school or anything, but, you know, he's, he's, you know, a little rough patch here, rough there. I'm just trying to help him out. He's, he's blood though, man. And, and I, I just want to entrust my drill to him. I just want to, you know, whatever it might be, the scalpel to him. You, you would in no way, would you sit down on that chair and go, you know, I think that's a good, that's good sound judgment. You would walk out of there and you would look at everybody that works for that doctor and you would say, you guys are all in big trouble. You're all in big trouble. And maybe you've done that even in, in the workplace. Or there's been something in life that you can relate to. Solomon's like, that's an injustice in this world under the sun. It's an injustice that takes place when you take God out of the equation. There's no wisdom. So, Whatever the case might be, the leader who puts wrong people in a place of authority, he lacks character, and he lacks judgment, and he lacks discernment. And they probably have incompetent people around them advising them if this is happening as well. But if a leader surrounds himself with unwise people, he will become an unwise leader. And occupying a high position in life is no indicator of a person's skill or durability or even character. Those things are revealed on the basis of the kind of decision-making that they display and on the leadership that they display. So Solomon moves on next from the topic of foolish rulers to the topic of foolish workers in verse 8. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Now, Solomon, he was describing people here who are or attempting to do work, and they, they suffered because, well, they were foolish. So, verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it, and whoever breaks through a wall will be bit by a serpent. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits wood may be endangered by it. If an axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. Verse 11, a serpent may bite when it is not charmed. The babbler is no Different. So, again, just describing people who are attempting to do their work, but they're suffering because uh, they're, they're foolish. The first guy, one man, he, he digs a pit, perhaps a well or, or somewhere to store his grain in that particular day and age, but he himself has fallen into the pit. I've dug many holes, trenches in my life, and I just want to go on record of saying I haven't fallen into any of those pits 
or holes that I have dug. But I have fell into a couple of ditches in my day. I just want to be honest about that. But why did this guy fall into his own pit? The idea is he lacked wisdom and he failed to take the proper precautions. That's the idea. Another man, he, he breaks through a wall. Perhaps he's remodeling a house or something like that. And a serpent bites him. Now, in those days, serpents kind of found their ways into hidden crevices and, and corners and whatnot. And this just pictures the guy that's not careful. He, he should have been more more careful. He's overconfident, and he didn't look ahead. Then verse 9 takes us to the, the quarries and, and even to the forest where careless workers are injured, cutting stones and then splitting logs. And then verse 10, I kind of like this, if the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom brings Success. So verse 10 here, he, he pictures the foolish worker, you know, the par excellence, a man who tried to split wood with a dull axe. The wise worker will pause. He'll sharpen his axe as the popular slogan goes. And we've said it a lot. Don't work harder, but work smarter. We know. It was Abraham Lincoln who says, give me six hours. To cut down a tree, I'll spend the first four of those hours sharpening my axe. Now, there's spiritual application here as well. How many of you guys know we need to stay sharp as Christians today? Amen? We do. Man, we don't want to become dull spiritually. You get this because you're here in the middle of a week carrying Bibles, opening Bibles, Worshiping the Lord, studying the Bible. Think of the advantage that you and I will now have in cutting through this action-packed, demanding world that is pressing in on us on every side because tonight we gave a little bit of time to sharpen our spiritual tools. Think of the advantage we have. Think of the advantage we have by opening God's word and, and allowing him to win over more of our thinking, win over more of our heart, directing our steps. Think of the advantage we have in the workplace by opening God's word that speaks to us about the workplace. Think of the advantage that we're going to have with difficult bosses and people that are abusing authority because we have given just a little bit of time to God's word to sharpen us up so that we will be effective in those where everyone else is getting frustrated and, 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 and emotion is getting the best of them, we have been sharpened and we'll cut right through that. There is such an advantage to be, you know, having our spiritual tune, our, our spiritual tools honed in. Being sharpened and being up or tuned up spiritually is, 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 is very important. Being in tune with his voice. Being in tune with his word is time well spent. It will produce incredible dividends. Verse 11, a serpent may bite when it is not charmed, but the babbler is no different. So snake charmers, uh, again, in those days I had to read up about this. I knew nothing about snake charmers, but uh, uh, we don't have them much in our culture. But in those days, a snake charmer, they said, would, would do this to make money. He would, you know, he would usually a flute or some sort of instrument, and they, they talked about how they would get the snake to kind of be mesmerized by their movement. The snake's not hearing things. It's kind of absorbing the reverberation of the, the instrument through its bones. And so as this guy's moving, it's moving with the sound. It's following the sound, and it kind of just gets a little bit spell uh, bound by that. And, and then, then the the... the, the the charmer is able to handle that snake in ways that otherwise he, he wouldn't. And, and oftentimes in those days, they'd even have a mongoose setting off the side that if the snake were to get out of line, the mongoose would take it out. But this is a picture of just a guy who, who, who he, was, he, was, he was a fool. He got, he, he, he just, a serpent may bite when he is not charmed. So for whatever reasons, he did not 
patiently go through the regiment of calming that snake down, and it bit him. And that, that affected his livelihood. That was the picture, because this man lived off of the donations of these people that would, ah, look at the man who charmed that snake. Look at him handling that snake. The common denominator among these foolish workers seems to be presumption. They were overconfident, overconfident, and ended up either hurting themselves or making their jobs harder. So the foolish ruler, the foolish worker, next he's going to talk about the foolish talker in verse 11. Uh, verse 12, excuse me. So, well, I guess the latter part of verse 11 ties into this. A serpent may bite when it's not charmed. But then he talks about the babbler. This ties into the next few verses. The babbler is no different. Um, talking about the person who just talks and 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 says whatever comes to their mind and and. And anything and everything, ultimately, they will bite you, is what Solomon is inferring with that verse. Some believe, because he's tying it into the first part of the verse, they'll bite you when they are no longer charmed by you. The talker, the talker, the talker. So you're listening, you're listening, listening. You're like, okay, that's great as long as you're listening to them. The second, they're no longer charmed by you. Those that will talk to you and talk to you and talk to you, Solomon says, they'll bite you. They will begin to talk about you and talk about you and talk about you. Just some wisdom there. Use some wisdom. Verse 12, the, wa- the words of a wise man, uh, his mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. So the wise person. The wise person will speak gracious words that are suited to the, the people that are listening and, and, and suited to the occasion. It's just, you, you, you know, you've got to be able to read your audience and be able to think through and watch. Um, again, how I, you know, maybe even talk on a Tuesday night. What is tonight? Wednesday night. Yeah, let's get that straight. What, what week is it? <laughs> but on a Wednesday night. Oftentimes when I'm up here, I'm looking at you guys, and you guys have a different posture than Sunday morning. I'm just going to tell you. You do. You make me want to teach. You just make me want to teach. You make me want to slow down, think through my words, talk with this hand moving right at you. There's just something about a Wednesday night crowd. I don't know. It's the hunger in your eyes. I don't know what it is. Sunday morning, I want to preach. I just want to preach. I have curious eyes. I have first-time eyes. I have friends who brought their friends' eyes. And it just... And so you're reading your audience, and a wise person will do that. When I go to a funeral, I actually wear clothes that show the people I respect them and their loved one that has deceased. People see me walking around here in a suit, and they're like, shocked. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I marry him and bury him in this thing. You know, that's just part of the deal. But I, I go as far as to even as I, 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 I move towards that service, I'm praying about, Lord, what is it you want me to say? How do you want me to say it? And oftentimes I'll walk into the room and I'll go meet the family. And all I'm trying to do is, what's, what's the vibe? What's going on? Where are we at with this, Lord? I'll walk up and I'll start watching as I'm talking. I'll do an introduction. And my, my inter- everything I'm saying in that introduction at a funeral is I am, I am throwing some stuff out there. And if I see a lot of tears and it's hard to hear, I go one way. If I see an openness and an agreement with that, I go another way. It's, it's ultimately going to get to the gospel, and we're going to get there. But having done this year after year for a number of years, I've offended people. I've, I've, I've went about it the wrong way. I didn't know how important it was to you know, know an audience at a, at a funeral or even at a wedding. At weddings, you get away with about anything. But <laughs> everyone's watching the bride. So. But, and, and, and what's true for me in those settings and how I had to grow and still have to grow and mature in so many ways, it's true for you. It's true, it's, it's true for you in your marriage. It's true for you in the relationships that you have. It's true for you in, in those you lead or for those relationships 
that require you to follow. It's, it's wise to speak gracious words that are suited to the, the, the people you're talking to and to the occasion. Proverbs 25, 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Now, in contrast to that, there's the fool. The fool just kind of blurts out whatever's on their mind and doesn't consider how it's going to affect the people that they're talking to. They're just not they're thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about the audience. A wise person, a wise person will begin to think about the people they're talking to. And that's important, not just in a public setting like this, in, in every setting. Now, in the end, the fool himself is, you know, the one who is hurt, you know, the most. But the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. In the NIV, it says, a fool is consumed by his own lips. Verse 13, the words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is uh, raving madness. <laughs> so, you know, we're again, talking about the foolish person. We've all encountered people who, you know, in the very moment they begin to speak to us, you think, okay, this is, this is crazy. There's no way that they're going to say anything crazier than this. But then they say something crazier than that. And you're like, oh, okay, this is getting even more crazy. And it's getting a little bit more crazy. And, and, and trust me, I'm around people sometimes. With, they, they, they got a lot to say, and that's all good, and I want to be a good listener. But there are times when I'm talking to someone, I'm just listening, and I thank the Lord that my phone rings. <laughs> just saying, okay, hold that thought. <laughs> and that's not an insensitive thing. That's just an observation I make with my own life that agrees with Solomon and his assessment of a fool. That's all. And I think we all have those comparative uh, things in our life that we can say, yeah, we've seen that. And the idea is, don't become that. Don't become the, the fool in that particular um, scenario. Verse 14. A fool also multiplies words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? Question mark. The labor of fools wearies them. For they do not even know how to go to the city. Now, this is the guy. He's talking about this guy. This is the guy who, who doesn't know what he's talking about as he's talking about something he's trying to convince you he knows something about. This is the guy... Who, who talks about business with such conviction and such passion. He's got all these business ideas, but the guy hasn't held down a job for five years. He's that guy. He's the guy that's like coming across as an economist, but he hasn't held down a job for, you know, five years. This is the guy who, who is clueless about his today but he talks about life as if he knows what's going to happen tomorrow. That's how foolish this foolish guy can be and how foolish this person can sound. And we all know when we were younger, we, we, you know, we knew it all, didn't we? Didn't we know it all when we were younger? Jun go to junior high for a second. We knew it all. And we predicted the future, like it was, it was promised to us, and we had it all figured out. And, and our, sometimes our parents look at us and go, you are clueless. And then you become the parent of that junior high person, and, and, and maybe even older. And you, 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 you look at that and you, you go, that is so immature. And that's, that's what Solomon sees. Life under the sun, taking God out of the equation, that's how immature people can look and how immature people can think, and how immature people can speak, and how immature people can sound. Utter foolishness. So, verse 15, The labor of fools wearies them, for they don't even know how to go to the city. So, 
you know, destructive words, you know, our words. Um, destructive words are compared to weapons of war in Proverbs 25, 18. Destructive words are compared to a fire that destroys in James chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Destructive words are compared to a poisonous beast there as well in James chapter 3, verses 7 through 8. Cool verse, Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Some cool scriptures. So, foolish rulers, foolish workers, foolish talkers, now foolish officers, which are the ones that work under the rulers. 16. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Now, again, he's talking about immature leadership under these rulers. Leaders who want to party instead of work. If the king is immature, <laughs> the people he gathers around him, if a ruler is immature, the people that he gathers around him will reflect that immaturity and take advantage of it. Real leaders are going to use their authority to build others up, to build their nation up, to build their empire up, to build their company up, while immature leaders are going to use the nation or use the company to build their own authority up. So woe to you, O land, <coughs> when your king is a child, when your king is immature. Now this can happen in the church. That's why Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 not to be bringing in any novices. Not to be bringing in any novices. Don't bring in somebody who's, who's too young, who hasn't been seasoned, who hasn't matured, is the, I, the idea. Now, how many of you guys know that age, chronological age, is no guarantee of maturity? There can be people in their 70s that are radically immature. But it is a very important especially in, the, in kingdom work, in the body of Christ, in marriage and these things, that, that, that mature people are, are those that God would choose so that the mature people are actually chosen by the people of God. A mature leader is going to show discipline. A mature leader is going to show competence. Oswald Chambers said, spiritual maturity is not reached by passing off the years but by obedience to the will of God. And that's how you can see it. Who's lining themselves up with God's word? Blessed are you, O land, in verse 17, when your king is the son of nobles. The people are blessed when their leaders are well prepared to lead. Verse 17, the latter part. And your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Talking about leaders and what they will produce in the leaders coming up under them. They're disciplined. The idea here is that they, they, they're balanced. They have a healthy life that allows them to be effective and efficient, not like the partier leaders and what they produce in verse 16, or the partying rulers you know, immature rulers that produce partier subjects underneath them as leaders. Verse 18. Because of laziness, the building decays, and through idleness of hands, the house leaks. Listen, whether it's a, a building, or whether it's a government, or whether it's a country, or whether it's a life, all of that, any of that, can ultimately collapse if it is not properly maintained. And that is true for the church. It doesn't just happen. These are people that God puts 
into positions that make these things happen. I was meeting with some pastors just recently, and we were talking about what we all sat around as couples, and we threw out there in our discussion the one, two things. We said we want to go around the horn. It took us a day and a half, but we said we want to go around the horn. All these guys have been in ministry for 25 years or more, and we said we want you to share one, one thing that you would say is a blessing in your life right now, just one thing. And then after you talk about that one thing that is a blessing, men and women both, we want you to share one challenge in your life right now. And, and, and it, it went from like small talk to tears and transparency. Real. Just raw real. And, and all of these guys in ministry are, you know, they're, they're looking at their churches. God has blessed their ministries. We're thankful for that. We talked about God's blessing in our marriage, God's blessing in our families, and we're all talking about grandkids now. And then when we, we began to talk about the challenges and the hardship, if that, if that same opportunity for that conversation would have happened maybe 15 years ago with all of us, I think we would have talked more about the hurt we would be experiencing through people. Because when you're coming up through ministry, that's the difficult parts of ministry. And then after a while, you mature and you realize, no, that's part of ministry. That's the character-forming part of ministry. And you begin to not compartmentalize that or just accept that or tolerate that. No, you begin to actually say, okay, God, with that. It's just, it's part of it. And you realize these people aren't your enemies. They are victims of the enemies. These are, these are just, it's a spiritual hospital and God's going to bring people in and some of them will be kicking and swinging. And if you don't duck, you're bad. But now, I was amazed as a maturing man myself. I was, I was amazed at what was coming out, at, at what was the most difficult part in these maturing pastors and their wives, in, in, in their lives. And a lot of it was this. It was the state of the flock. It was, we've got churches, lots of people and lots of, of ministry. But it was, where are those? Where are those who, when we were in our 20s, were captivated by ministry? You couldn't keep us away. The Bible school classes I went to, if you didn't get signed up, you weren't in. Me and Lori were going to them. I, I, I want to get into my whole story. But there was, there was an era that we all came up in that's very different than this era. And we are very blessed here as a church. I'm, I keep, I'm going to be personal now. We are very blessed here as a church. We are so thankful for the, the work that God has done. But as it's growing, we're seeing the numeric demands, even in our church, outgrow the next generation and their ability to answer the call. And what we need is maturity. And that doesn't happen overnight. By a show of hands, how many of you in this room are under the age of 30? Raise your hand. Up high. I need to see him, man. Okay, I'm going to say 5% of us. 5% of us. Under 40, raise your hands. How did that be less? That's a... I guess, okay. Yeah. Somehow that went down, okay. Something about 10% of us here. See my point? These are, these are realities. When I teach this stuff, I, I, I shine this on myself as first. I shine this on myself, and, and this is happening on my watch. This is happening on my watch. I don't, I don't shine myself at the next generation and go, where are the old? It's not that. I'm like, oh, Lord. This is hard. This is heavy. Where are those who are willing in their younger years to take up the hard and the heavy? Where are they? Men and women. And so as we're all sitting around, it wasn't just me making that observation. I was blessed. I'm like, we're so blessed with the servants here and everything. But it's, it's not the younger generation. We have a lot here in our younger generation. They're serving, the interns and that kind of thing. But by and large, those numbers are not going to be able to sustain the growth of this church. They just won't. 
So what, what's the answer? What's the solution? We're not here to talk about that. I'm being honest with you as a leader. A leader will assess what's going on and be honest with it and not put the blame on someone else. He'll take it on himself and say, this is what we need to do. Lord, help us. And these are great challenges. This isn't any more difficult than planting a church or coming up and, 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 and watching God grow this church. It's just a new season with its own set of challenges. But as you hear this, you're, this, this passage is speaking to both leaders and followers. Something needs to resonate within your heart, not just my heart. God, God drew you here tonight just like he drew me here tonight. We open this passage up together. We are uniquely responsible for what we've heard tonight. And it's good stuff. But there's a building, a government, or a life. It will ultimately collapse if it is not properly maintained. And it doesn't just happen. How many people come up you know, to a church like ours? You got the nicest parking guys. Yeah, they're, they're nice, by the way, because they've been eating donuts. I just want you to know that. You got all these guys greeting you and you walk in the door. There's been people working on the sanctuary for probably three days. Every single time you sit in these seats, there's been people here cleaning, scrubbing, setting up, setting up, you know, I mean, just techie guy. There's just all of this going into your experience. There's people that love you. There's people that, 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 that care about that. There's... There's a, a heart to not just maintain, but to, to grow and to expand what God is doing in and through this place. And that's to be responsible with the facility along with souls. As, as we're walking around through the development next door, you know, uh, I was walking through last night. Some guys came to our stake and study, and um, some of them got saved in the surf shop. Many of them the, the, the last time they ever hung out with me in a Bible study setting was 25 years ago in, in a church setting. I, I meet with them once a month now down in San Clemente. But I, I, I just was so proud. They all wanted to come. They just wanted to come last night. And, and we were done eating, and one of the guys is like, hey, look, can we, let's walk. I go, come on, I'll show you around. We had just a couple of minutes, but we were walking through the back, and they were asking me question after question after question. And I turned around, and I'm like, I can't explain how this happened. I can't explain. You want to know what God has done over the last 25 years? I can't. I just kept walking. They get, Lance, how did this happen? So finally, we, we kind of walked around, and I walked them through the next. That was a, even a worse thing to do is to walk them into, like, what's coming next? They had even more questions. They had crazy questions. And I sit there, and I go, I was laughing, and, and we, we came, came around the side over here where we're building you women a new restroom, by the way. And... I know. Thank you, Lord. Jeez. So, and, and, and Mead was in here lay, playing worship, and this place was filled with men raising their voices. And I stopped at that door in a dark corridor there, and I says, this is how it happens. I go, I can't even explain that. It's a Tuesday night, and there's hundreds of guys standing in a room worshiping the Lord right now. I can't explain that, guys. I just know it's the Lord. But let me tell you why I was walking them around. I was hoping that something would rub off on them. I was hoping that they would see what God is doing, and some of that would just grab a hold of them, and they would take that to their church. They would take that to their community. And, and, and we do have with our men here a, a, a very intentional, very oiled, very thought through, prayed through, mentoring program that I will take any man who says, I am serious about Jesus Christ through. Because that is the future of this church. And I don't care how old they are or how young they are. It's not the deal. What we're looking for is who is saying, I'm ready to go deeper in my walk with Jesus Christ. Who is saying, please help me develop Christ-like character and become more mature because I need it. And when, they, when that person is found, and they're humble enough to say that, they're in, because that's me. And I want to surround myself with those people, because I'm just like that. And that's what Solomon's saying. Whether it's a home, 
or it's a business, or it's a nation, or whether it's a church. Anyone would sit back and say, you know, just take care of me. Anyone can sit back and critique it. But who will have God grab their heart to take care of it? That's the difference. That's maturity. And that's what he's talking about. That's a leader. That's a leader. i got to close this up. Verse 19. You guys went eight minutes over. We're going to finish this tonight, so sorry. Are we okay? Okay, good. Just two more minutes. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything? Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Let's just close our Bibles and just... Talking about immature leaders. Listen. Talking about immature leaders that look at position as just status. Or even here, they're looking at the position as something fun. They're there to enrich themselves, not the people that they are overseeing. Solomon says, to those type, you know who they are. Because when things get tough, when things go wrong, they will not put that on themselves. They will say, it is because we don't have enough money. Then they push for more taxes if that's what they're overseeing. Or they cry out for more funds so that they can hire people to do the things that they should have been doing all along. The immature leader. 20, we made it. Do not curse the king. Even in your thought, do not curse the rich, the accomplished. Even in your bedroom, in the more secret place of life. For a bird of the air may carry your voice. <laughs> I just like this. And a bird in flight may tell a matter. Now, this is a wise man who definitely is what, man, I wish I never said that before. Immature leaders. When you have foolish rulers, you'll have immature leaders. And he's even addressing the immature leaders. He's like, don't talk. Just do not talk. It will always get back to your ruler. It just will. Immature leaders talk. They can't help themselves. He's like, hey, just trust me on this one. It will get back to your ruler. So what do we do? We, the best thing we can do, man, we can trust God. Bring him into the equation. Amen? Amen? Do our work. Keep our post. Accept what God brings our way. And, and as we learned last week, enjoy each day of our life as if it's the last one we got on this earth. Amen. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Help us to apply this. And we just simply ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, let's all stand. There's me. I have the great privilege and honor of introducing me, Chesbro. Good leader. He's a great leader. Sunday morning, second service, if you want to see me dedicate my first grandson, Ezra. Second service, we'll be in here, and we're going we're gonna to shed a tear, I think. It's going to be good. It's late. God bless you. Have a great night. As we uh, sing this last song, if uh, you need prayer for anything, our prayer ministry will be up front. We'd love to pray with you. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those.
there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. God bless.